You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. Now, several of you have written me, I guess, over the past couple of weeks now, asking whether or not we were going to do another Black Panther themed episode. Uh, If you remember back in 2018, we did a bonus episode around the design of Black Panther. I think we did it roughly about a week or so after the movie had come out. But that was an episode with myself, uh, Regine Gilbert, Paul Anthony Webb and Jordan Green had a really great conversation about the movie, about the design, the music, etc., It's one of our best episodes. Actually, it's one of the episodes that's in the Smithsonian for the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And so with Black Panther Wakanda Forever out, um, I've already seen it twice now. (laughs) Um, We are going to release a bonus episode about the design of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. We actually just recorded it over the weekend. So I've got to, you know, finish doing some production magic on it. But check out our feed later on this week for when the bonus episode drops. Should be about Thursday or Friday, I think. I think we're going to drop it like Friday morning. But check out the feed for that. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Now, of course, if you've heard me talk the last couple of months, you've heard me talk about the Tenth Collective, which is this new talent collective initiative from Revision Path and from State of Black Design. And now that we've got the Revision Path job board as a part of it, it's actually even better for both job seekers as well as companies. So if you're a job seeker and you're looking for work, of course, you have the job board there and you can join the 10th Collective for free to be a part of our talent collective that has companies that are looking to hire black designers. And if you're a company that's looking to hire black designers, you can join the collective for a low monthly fee and you get access to all of these great profiles of people that are in the collective. And then you can reach out to them to help out with your recruiting efforts. Super, super simple, super, super easy. If you're a black designer and you're looking for work, maybe you've been affected by one of these mass tech layoffs that have happened over the past few months or weeks. You want to be a part of this. It's free to join. All you have to do is fill out a really short profile and you're all set. And you'll only get contacted by companies when they are ready to talk to you. So it's not some sort of thing where you're going to get spam from myself or from State of Black Design. They're only going to reach out to you when they want to talk to you. So it's sort of a good resource to just have in your back pocket as you're looking for your next opportunity. So if you want to be a part of this, head over to the 10 collective.com to join. There's a link where you can do that. We've also put a link in the show notes. Check it out. We'd love to have you. This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important, and that begins with your domain name. Show the online community who you are and what you're passionate about with Hover. With over 400 plus domain extensions to choose from, including all the classics and some fun niche extensions, Hover is the only domain provider I use and trust. So what are you waiting for? Go to hover.com forward slash revision path and you can get 10% off your first purchase. Now for this week's interview, I'm talking with Tiffany Stewart, a senior UX designer in Chicago, Illinois, who focuses on design systems and accessibility. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Tiffany Stewart. I'm a senior UX designer specializing in digital systems with a focus on accessibility. And yeah, that's me. Very much a blurred and just really passionate about accessibility and UX. How's the year been going for you so far? How's 2022? Oh my gosh, 2022 has been a blast and then some. I bought a house. <laughs> so oh, nice. I'm offic- right, I am officially now a homeowner and I am in the process of building out my office. So I went and bought the Ikea cabinets and I attached them to the wall and I'm painting and I'm sanding and breaking out the miter saw. So. Wow. That is my life at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a huge accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you. It was a lot. The process was a lot because I think it was like right before the interest rates went up. So it was Mm -hmm. just like, oh my gosh, I have to hustle and get this house (laughs) before everything just goes to pot. So, Well, I mean, that's such a a big accomplishment already for the year. Is there anything else that you still want to try to 
accomplish before 2023? I have so many, but I think for like the immediate goal for me is to to see this Black Panther movie that's coming out <laughs> this year. Ah, uh, yes. One, the Black Panthers. And then on my professional work and getting my design system up and running to a point where it's doing what it needs to do and folks are able to use it in a meaningful way. So yeah, that's, those are my big ones for the end of the year. Okay. Let's tap into a little bit about the work that you do. You mentioned you're a senior UX designer and you're working at uh, Thomson Reuters. Talk mm-hmm, to me about mm-hmm. that. I think they initially hired me as a contractor to work on one of their products as a regular UX product designer. And then once they heard about my previous work on a design system prior, they're like, oh, we'll just move you over to the design system side so we can get that sort of up and running and you can help with facilitate that process. And I was like, "Okay, cool. And so I shifted into that particular space. Design system tends to be more because I think not many people know what design system designers do. It's more of a space where you're looking at applying concepts across the board holistically for several products and several teams and spaces. So my day-to-day is really thinking about, okay, how do I apply the concept of warning across a design system so that all of the products are consistently representing warning in a way that's meaningful and consistent? So my day-to-day is that making decisions about what our colors are going to be and how they're going to be expressed and just setting all of that up so that the designers can build their products relatively quickly because all of these decisions are already sort of made for them so they can already just bring those into play. And then working closely with the accessibility team, which I'm very excited. The first time I've actually ever had one, Uh, usually it's just me doing it by myself, but we do have a dedicated accessibility team at TR and they're amazing to work with. And we just make sure that the DS is accessible as possible so that our products are accessible as possible. So that's my day to day. Tell me more about that accessibility. Like, I'm I'm curious, what does that look like at like a, a news organization like Thomson Reuters? And a lot of it is making sure that we are meeting CAG requirements. We're making sure that within the code itself, the everything is labeled with the correct ARIA labels, that the DOM is in the correct order so that when you are tabbing through with your headings, everything gets represented semantically type of thing. Making sure that people who are using screen readers are able to get their news in a way that is accessible and meaningful to them. Because mm-hmm. I think most people think when they think of accessibility, they think, oh, I just have to match the color contrast ratio of three to one or whatever it is at the time. But no, it's actually making sure that the code works, that someone who is a purely keyboard user can tab through. Everything makes sense when they tab through. They can read things, whether they are blind or otherwise situationally disabled. And so, yeah, we meet with the accessibility team regularly. My particular specialist that we work with is Yvonne. Hey, Yvonne. And then I think on the other side, it was Ferial. Mm -hmm. So we meet with them regularly. There's a whole team of them. They're amazing. We reach out, we ask questions, we pair and make sure that the code matches as well as the Figma files match so that all of our products in theory leave the board, Mm -hmm. you know, fully accessible. So it sounds like that's a lot to kind of do from day to day. Like what does your regular like everyday job look like? It is a lot of pairing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I will pair with devs. I will pair with, like I said, Yvonne on accessibility. And then it's also a lot of research to make sure that we are meeting the use cases that are given to us by the various teams that we work with. And then figuring out those solutions for how do we solve their problem, but sort of make it agnostic to a design system because that's it can't be really specific the teams are usually responsible for the more specific work that they do in terms of like the workflow for their particular product. Mm -hmm. But from the DS side, it's more of like a super relatively agnostic approach to how can I apply? What does a header look like in an agnostic way that everybody can just pull from the DS and use? Modify here and there, but for the most part, this is generally what a header should look like and where things should go. And it is accessible because we've already sort of sorted out that when you tab through, it's going to go through here, 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 and here. And just to be clear, like a design system would be different from, say, like 
a brand guide or something because it seems like because you're applying this across several different products, there's just going to be different, like you said, situations or use cases mm-hmm. where you may not be able to apply it directly, but maybe some mm-hmm. elements of it. Am I getting that right? Yeah, that sounds about reasonable. So usually the now brand does sort of inform a lot of the things because we can set those colors and that typography and some of the spacing as set colors within the system. And then if you are that brand and you are on the brand team, you in theory, we at least have those in the system so that you can pull them if you need to. Those decisions are already made. So your H1 is in whatever font with whatever spacing that's already sort of set in the base token work. Mm -hmm. So whenever the engineers go to code it, they don't have to worry about it. That H1 is always going to be that H1. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. What's probably the most difficult part about what you do? Probably convincing other designers that accessibility is is the thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> that that is probably the hardest thing. Now, I will say that my coworkers and my teammates are, at TR are very much like we're all very passionate about accessibility, so it's not so much a problem there per se. But I've worked with other designers before, or other strategists, or other brand folks who are just it is pulling teeth to get them to do the bare minimum of like a contrast check on a color or Mm -hmm. a button or trying to understand that there are people like, is there a focus state that's set? What happens if you try to tab through? Because a lot of sites will break. I think in my example at the State of Black Design talk, I was just trying to buy a book from a website, but just using my keyboard and it completely failed. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't able to check out. So In my mind, if we're making a use case for it, which I don't generally like applying to accessibility, but if you do need to make a use case or a business use case for it, you're preventing people from buying your product by not making it as accessible as as possible. It's easy to throw away accessibility, I think, because people, as a rule, seem to it's a very general rule, and I'm being very generic here, Mm -hmm. seem to be willing to ignore people with disabilities or having a disability in general. You know, you hear all these stories nowadays of airlines who are completely throwing away people's wheelchairs or (laughs) or people not allowing the dog for the blind user in the space because of whatever. And it's just, there's a level of disposability there Mm -hmm. that I personally don't enjoy and I don't like seeing it. And more so too, if you're looking at the numbers in the US, a good majority of the people who have disabilities do tend to be black and brown people. So then I'm doubly more so like, oh no, 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 we have to get into this. Yeah. (laughs) We absolutely have to get into this. And I mean, accessibility is one of those things that has definitely increased in importance over the years, not just because more and more mm-hmm. people have gotten on the web, but there are now more and more ways of experiencing the web that is not just through a standard computer mm-hmm. monitor. There's laptops, yeah. there's smartphones, there's smart watches, there's there's probably a toaster out there that can get online. Like there's all these different ways now to access information on the web. And granted, those use cases are important, but also just, you know, as you mentioned, just differently able people will have different sorts of things like vision requirements, you know, for high Mm -hmm. contrast or colors or even Mm alts, like the alt text that you put on images, you know, is like, I think, almost remedial accessibility. And that's still something a lot of people hem and haw over. Oh, my gosh. They will they will fight you down. They will absolutely fight you down. (laughs) Or they'll like produce this interface that has no contrast whatsoever. And so you're just guessing at this point as to what is happening on that page. I don't know, because I think the new thing is now is like everything is light and bright. So there's no borders on anything and everything just fades into the next one. And mm-hmm. it's very pretty aesthetically. I will give it that. But unfortunately, it's not really usable by everyone. Yeah. And I think often people forget that by and large, when you make something that is accessible to be, that is usable by everyone, everyone benefits, everyone benefits there, you know, like the grab bar in the bathroom, I am not disabled. However, (laughs) the amount of times that I have slipped on the conditioner 
and that grab bar <laughs> saved my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it can look cute too. So yeah, it's just accessibility works literally for everyone. So why not just, why not do it? Right. And accessibility also makes sure that as many people as possible can experience what it is that you're putting like on the web. Yes. I remember back in the day, like we're talking and you, I mean, this is like early 2000s, maybe even before that, when websites would have mm-hmm. those badges that are like, this site is best viewed in Internet Explorer 6 yes. on, a, what, on, a, yes, yes. <laughs> on a desktop Yo. that's 1024 by 768. <laughs> like it was almost like a bouncer at the door telling you yeah. you have to be this old to get in or something. Yeah. Well, no, it's a matter too, because I think what people don't include in accessibility when they are thinking about the digital part of it too, is that they don't include access. Not everybody has access to the best monitor. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has access to the fastest processor. Not everybody has access to a credit card. Like we, when we make everything credit card only for the longest time, I think before like a Venmo and a PayPal came into the play, It was just kind of like, so the people that don't have a credit card or don't have that level of financial literacy don't deserve to buy things? What are we saying (laughs) when we don't include that as part of the conversation around access and accessibility? So, And I would say one thing that has also, I think, made accessibility more important is the increase of multimedia on the web. Like, yes. we're, I mean, we're, we're recording a podcast. This podcast will have transcripts for accessibility, transcript? yes. but like oh, yes. videos with I'm captions and things like yes. that, you know, we're yes. starting to see it be more and more commonplace now that the, the media that we consume is not just what we read. It's also what we hear, what we see, even see. like smart mm-hmm. speakers and devices. You have to talk to them in a certain way in order to get back what you need. Like all of that is a factor of accessibility. Yeah, no, I think they just released a study maybe day before yesterday that Netflix was saying that the good majority of their users that have subtitles turned on are not blind or deaf. Yeah. It's just, yeah. There's hmm. some shows I would watch with with subtitles. I used to watch Scandal with subtitles. Yeah. Just so I, I could make sure I could watch, catch I what they my, were mine on. Yeah, no, because I'm like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Another thing that it's good for, and this is not so much accessibility, but like if you're watching foreign language programs, to have oh, subtitles mm-hmm. in a different language. I mean, for me, it can help with like learning a bit of the language because you know what they're mm-hmm. trying to say and what you hear, you kind of, your mind kind of connects those things together. But like, even with accessibility, there's bad captions out there. So, oh my gosh, it, it's, I live it's a those. whole thing. I need to make a website that's just like bad captions because they'll be like pop music playing enthusiastically. And you're like, what? <laughs> Where did that? <laughs> The descriptions are great. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. But I'm just glad that they're there at this point. Because like I said, you know, people don't think about those things a lot of times. So Right. And I mean, we're talking about now accessibility in a largely, I don't want to say 2D context. You might see where I'm going Mm -hmm. here. But like, there's been all this talk about Web3 and the metaverse. And you want to talk about inaccessibility. It's inaccessible even for the average person, because yeah. it's not only about, you know, what you can hear or see, but just to get it. And this, you know, maybe this is a tangent of accessibility, but like you have to be watching on a certain device that yep. costs a certain amount of money and you've got yep. to have a high speed Internet connection. Like, you know, there are other yep. barriers that I think yes. people might not look at as accessibility that does factor into that accessible absolutely. web experiences. Absolutely. I talk about it all the time. I'm like, so let's talk about the actual ex experience part of this. Mm -hmm. How am I meant to experience this when I don't have access to any of these things? Or, I mean, maybe your point is to gatekeep. I don't Mm -hmm. know. Maybe because, you know, because that's usually the argument that will come up too, is that like, oh, well, those people are not my target demographic. And I'm like, run me by again. What exactly (laughs) is your target demographic? Because every demographic has someone who may or may not be disabled. So I'm not really sure why. Like, again, it just plays back like the disposability of people with disabilities. So I just, it's stressful to me. I get annoyed (laughs) all the time. Let's kind of switch gears here a little bit. Let's learn more about you, about your origin story. I can tell you're very passionate about, about UX and about accessibility, but I'd like to kind of get a sense of where that came from. So like, just to start off, like, where'd you grow up? So I am originally from Jamaica. I moved here when I was about maybe 14, 15. Don't ask me about the numbers. It was a long time ago. 
and then uh, moved here. And, you know, the immigrant family story, my options were either engineer, doctor, MBA. <laughs> like my, my career choices were very narrow based mm-hmm. on, on that particular set of criteria, which to be fair, I gave my mom her engineering degree so I could be left alone. <laughs> but yeah, no, right. But everyone in my family is either a physician or a NASA scientist in, in my cousin's part. So we're all pretty diverse in terms of like our applications to STEAM and STEM work. I was actually going to be a surgeon at one point. I was attending NYU as a bio major to do that. But yeah, I think working with my mom in terms of like listening to her talk about medicine as it's and medical practice as it functions today in the US and really hearing the stories about how people with disabilities or even older people are treated in the hospital system. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't sit back and not say anything about it. So I think I got a lot of it from going to work with my mom and seeing how people were being treated within the medical space, you know, and even being handed like their prescriptions and they couldn't read it or they had to fill out online forms and they didn't know how. And I don't know if you've ever tried to fill out online form via a hospital, but it's usually a very bad process. Mm -hmm. Nothing is readable. Any of those things don't even ask them about like a language option for you. So going through all of that and watching my mom do it and then getting into the digital space and then understanding and linking the two was probably what drove most of my passion for accessibility. So yeah. you had this kind of early, from what it sounds like, just based on like life experience that you had this early desire to get into this. But then you also just said, like, I gave my mom her engineering degree. So you went, I want to talk a little bit about that. You went to undergrad, you went to the yes. university of Mississippi and majored in electrical engineering. Did you have an interest in it or were you just like, this is what I, I need did. to do to like get my family off my back? No, 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 no. I, so I did. <laughs> I too, I really, really did. So back, oh my gosh, my mom is going to be so mad. So I dropped out of NYU. <laughs> okay. To which my mother was livid. And that's fair. But then I dropped out of NYU because the company that I worked for at the time had given me a promotion and wanted to send me out to California to train their engineers on a particular uh, ticketing system that we were using for our, our IT program. And so while I was out there, I ended up switching jobs. And then my job was basically what they call a client support specialist is what they called it. And I was basically a liaison between the engineering department project management and the salespeople and customers in order to get them moved into their co-location space, set up their routers, all of that extraneous good stuff. This was back before, like when we were doing network address translations and you had to do a letter of justification in order to get IPs because they thought that the IPs were going to run out. It was a whole thing. It was pre-2000, so like pre-Y2K. So it was, they were very concerned about these things. So I did that, but then the dot-com bubble essentially burst. And so a lot of us in Silicon Valley got let go. And so I came back and I was like, okay, mom, I'm ready. And so because of that work that I did with that ISP, I determined that I wanted to build computers because I thought that was fun. So I did electrical engineering, specializing in computer engineering. So in theory, I could build you a a badass circuit. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, that's that's how that happened. But you had the interest in it, though. Like, that's the important part, right? I am of a person who I like to take things apart and tinker. Mm -hmm. I like to work with my hands. Like I said, I'm building the shelves in my office. So miter saw, table saw, planer, let's go. And I've always been that person. And then I'm also an only child, my mom's only child. Mm -hmm. So she was very much of the this is broken. You need to figure out how to fix it because I have to go to work. So I was like, well, got to figure it out. Gotcha. So I've, but I've always had an interest in it and it was fine. I enjoy taking things apart. I'm a very curious person by nature. So I'm mm-hmm. always fascinated about how things work, how things are put together. And you'll see, you see me use the phrase all the time. Oh my God, that's fascinating. Because <laughs> I'm generally 
I am that person. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I mean, like I went to college and I majored in math. Well, no, let me roll that back. Hey, I, I yes, first majored, major. I first majored in computer science, computer engineering, because mm. this was like turn of the century, like 99, 2000, uh, started mm-hmm, college in 99. Mm-hmm. And like, I had been already kind of dipping my toe into web design with mm-hmm. tripod and angel fire, geo cities, kind of oh, like wow. re- reverse yeah. engineering view source web you know websites and stuff like that and i thought oh if i become a computer engineer i can design a website because i didn't know yeah (laughs) i didn't i I had not heard of what a web designer was or if that was like a thing and i remember Mm -hmm. taking that like that first semester i was taking courses in uh, i think it was intro to computer programming learning c plus plus and i was like this is not html what is this how (laughs) how do i make a website with this and i'm like going to my advisor and and telling him what i want to do and you know my advisor uh dr jones he was like if you want to you know do this internet stuff that's just a fad like if you want to get into that like this isn't gonna last you know that's not what we do here yeah (laughs) he's like we don't do that here i mean what but i will say they are teaching you the back end part of it yeah they just completely tossed you over for the front end but they gave me the back end part yeah but i mean but again this was stuff too oh yeah Mm -hmm. and this was 99 i mean like our lab had like sun microsystems and sgi machines and stuff like that so like this was still very very early in the web slash internet days and like he was like we don't do that here like we will teach you assembly we'll teach you c plus plus but like if you want to do this web design thing you might want to change your major and so the next semester I changed my major to math and then that's just what I ended up getting my degree in. Like I like math, but people are always surprised with me being a designer that I have a math degree. Like I would imagine people are probably surprised you as a designer have like an electrical engineering degree. They're like, how does that work? Like for me, math teaches mm -hmm. me how to think. I don't know about like, yeah, go ahead. Yes. That's what I was going to say. I think for engineering, it teaches you how to identify a problem and think about the steps needed to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So engineering for me teaches you how to think about problem solving, which as a UX designer, that is pretty much all that we do is problem solve. How do we get the the checkout flow to work in such a way that they actually finish checking out? Do like, you know what I mean? Like what are those steps? And if there's an error, what happens? So going through all of those steps and iterating on that process by testing every time, it's very much an engineering mindset, I think. Yeah. And like I know with math, the thing I think that struck me at one point learning math in college was that, oh, there are some equations that have either no solution or infinitely Mm -hmm. many solutions. And Mm -hmm. that blew my mind at the time because I was like, wait a minute, I've been taking algebra and trig and calc and like all these things have like they all they resolve to something. And they're like, well, there are often going to sometimes be equations that don't make sense that are not going to have a solution or they're going to have an infinite amount of solutions. And so when I say like, it teaches you how to think, at least for me, like it teaches me how to take something I may not know and like process it and break it down. Like the, Mm -hmm. the steps of writing a mathematical proof to me are the same steps to writing a research paper, the same steps Mm -hmm. to writing a proposal for a client or a statement Mm -hmm. of work. Like it's the same logical flow of like, take mm-hmm. these elements, prove this thing, therefore this, like all of that. Uh, like I, I used to I, love those. <laughs> I mean, I I, like I, I, I look like a some... kid in class who loves like <laughs> doing like the geometric proofs. I'm like, oh, I'm going to show you that this is a right angle. Yeah. Let me break it down right quick. <laughs> I look back at some of my old stuff. Like I found my thesis from, God, 20 years ago. I found my thesis recently that I wrote in college on like Sigma algebra and measure theoretic entropy with the existence mm-hmm. of Lie groups. I have no idea what any of those things mean now, but I'm looking back <laughs> at it and it's just like symbols and letters. I'm like, I used to really know this. I don't know it. Yes. Now. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, listen, I stopped because like with electrical engineering, especially at Ole Miss, they were like, we can't let you do a math minor. You'd have to double major and do EE and math. And I was like, listen, after differential equations, I'm good. <laughs> It was like differential, discrete, all of that. So, and I think after those classes is when you start getting into the theoretical math where they uh-huh. just don't use numbers at all. It's oh, just yeah. theory. 
and proving I, my last that this process worked. Yeah, like my last year and a half because I did I majored in pure math, and like my last year and a half mm-hmm. was just it was differential equations, it was topology, and my mm-hmm. teachers at I mean great teachers, but absolute sadists. They would be like, I'm going to, I'm going to give this test and not everybody is going to pass this test yep. or, or they'll yep. say, well, these last two questions are only from a top students. And like, they will be infinitely just wild mm-hmm. stuff. Like what mm-hmm. in the world? When am I ever going to use this? I've never had to use anything with differential equations ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love it though. The thing is I went into math because I, I love it. Like I love to do the problems and solving and all that sort of stuff, which is a lot about what design is. It's about solving problems, yeah. different kind yeah. of problem. But you're still solving mm-hmm. problems. And like math teaches you yeah. those like steps and ways to think and consider in a way that I mean, I, I I didn't go to design school, so I don't know. But I feel like it teaches you that logical way of thinking through something that perhaps design school may not. Yeah, because I think for me, at least it felt like design school was more about the psychology mm-hmm. of things. So like understanding color theory and understanding that different colors make people feel a different way yeah. than other colors do. So it's more so about like how these things make you feel more so than anything else. And so it was the engineering part that taught me the problem solving and then the design part that taught me like the sort of aesthetic piece. Is that it with the word? Yeah, yeah the aesthetic, the aesthetic piece, yeah. piece of it. Mm-hmm. And I how totally things get make that. You feel, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cuz like for example, if you put red text on a blue background, like yes, that's going to be really jarring. They won't go together. <laughs> but then like mathematically, I know it's because of like the frequency of mm-hmm. the color red against the color blue causes the your eyes to do like this weird jump shift. It's really tiring <laughs> yes. to read that. So yeah. I'm like, okay, that's why it doesn't make sense. Like I'll always be trying to think of the reason behind the feeling instead mm-hmm. of just like going with the feeling, mm-hmm. which I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe if I went to design school, I'd have more of that like woo woo, like, oh, yes, these colors, they mesh. I get it. As, a, <laughs> as yes. opposed to being like, well, they this makes sense because of, you know, words. some other reason. But like you end up going and majoring in design after you got your degree from Old Miss. You went to Mississippi yes. State and you majored in graphic design. Why did you kind of make that switch? Well, because I wanted to be an animator. Oh. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, I think they had not updated their website at the time. So Mississippi State was like, oh, we have an animation program because I really wanted to do graphic design for film or design for film. And so I was like, oh, I can combine my problem solving with design if I become an animator and do that. <laughs> that was a thought process in my mind. I mm-hmm. don't know why. So on their website, they hadn't updated it. And so I enrolled and got in and I was super excited. And they were like, oh, we no longer have that program. All we have for you is graphic design. Good luck. And I was like, huh, okay, well, let's try it and we'll see. But then I think at the time, maybe it was more so print focused than anything else. So I could tell you all the things about like the GSM of paper. We did watercolor, photography all of those things. One of my favorite classes was 3D design. And so that's when I spent most of my time in the wood shop. The instructor at the time was, I think he was like a famous furniture designer, but he was teaching us how to like build things by sketching it out, thinking about like from a 3D space perspective, how something would look. And then we would have to like build it, build it, build it. So like did some sculptural work. It was great. I was actually, oh my gosh, I had That design program, Mississippi State, is I loved it. It was great. And then they also allowed me to pair with the video game designers they had. And so I was doing design work for that, too. So it was a good time. Mm. I, yeah, no, even though it wasn't necessarily an animation program, I learned a lot from the graphic design program at at State. I I will say that. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Oh, my gosh. It was so much fun. And I'm still friends with a lot of people there. And the people that left that school went on to do amazing things. I think Tim is out here designing the graphics for Roku. Let's see. There's another young lady. She went on to work at Gensler as an architect. So mm-hmm. like the class is good. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the classes are really, really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And some of the, the students that came out of there based on the teachers that we had at the time were just amazing, amazing folks to work with. Do you feel like your background in engineering helped you out in any way when you were majoring in design? Yes and no. 
it helped me figure out how to approach thinking about what I was going to do if I needed to put together a logo per se. Like I knew I'm like, okay, this is the result that I wanted. What are the steps to get there? So in that sense, like the planning of how to do it Mm -hmm. was helpful. However, engineering is very much, I like things to be symmetrical. Like there's always those projects that we had to do that were like, you had to make something asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. And I did not enjoy that because my brain just refused. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that just came from the engineering side. It was like, no, it has to either be in order or it has to be on like a scale of some sort that I can understand, like two, four, six, eight, that type of thing. I can't have you jumping around all over the place in the design. It just, it makes my brain not work well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, so it does both. And more so now with the digital side of things. Like I said, it it mainly applies to the problem solving part of it where I'm like, oh, okay, we want to get this result. How do we apply that concept in a way that scales on a DS? And I can do that through like my engineering thinking coupled with my design thinking. So So once you you graduated from Mississippi State, you've got your design degree, you've got your engineering degree. Did you go Mm -hmm. right into UX design after that? No, I actually got a job at a church. It was one of those big churches, biggish churches in Austin, Texas. And I basically was doing everything. So I was doing all of their print work. So designed magazines, all of their photography. So a photographer. Mm -hmm. And then I was also responsible for building and maintaining their website. So it was a full on, you're the only person here. You have to do everything type of moment. And I learned a lot from that job, for sure. Yeah, printmaking and printing things is is no joke. Web work is no joke because I think at the time they only had access to, what is it, WordPress? So that was the medium that I was working with and Mm -hmm. WordPress has its own caveats. So putting all of that together and making sure everything got out on time every Sunday, it was, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. What I remember the most is we had to print magazines because the rector at the time wanted us to put out a monthly magazine that where we interviewed various people from the church. We had to take pictures of everything and there was this whole thing. So I was like a Vogue magazine editor, like with the big old board (laughs) where you put things up and your Mm -hmm. articles are there and you pick what pictures and you basically like art direct that whole entire process. But then after that was done, assembling them in this giant InDesign file and then sending that to the printer because we had a dedicated printer room. Mm-hmm. And, I, and so and like figuring out how the printer worked, troubleshooting all of that and then actually printing it, trimming the edges, cutting it, mailing it. It was um, I actually ended up sleeping at the office doing a magazine run. Wow. It was a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you were you were truly a webmaster <laughs> yes. doing all of that. Yes. I especially tip my hat to you about the magazine thing. The last gig that I worked at, we put together a quarterly magazine. And mm-hmm. that was a lot just to try to get it out the door, hopefully every three months. I can't imagine mm-hmm. every month. How mm-hmm. big was the magazine? It wasn't very big. It was like a very sort of, I want to say how many sheets as I'm looking through my paper, maybe like 24, 32. Okay. That's still a lot though to try to pull together every month. Listen, my main thing was like, cause like people would submit photos and the photos that they would submit, I'm like, this cannot be printed. It's entirely too small. (laughs) Then I'd have to schedule a photo shoot and run out there and retake all the photos and then run back. And so it was just, you know, but but the church had money. So we did what we had to do. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) It was a good time. Like I said, I learned a lot because it was literally only me. Mm -hmm. So I was responsible for all of it from the rooter to the tutor, as they say. As they say. Um, (laughs) Yeah, as they say, the rooter to the tutor. And so it was just picking the font, understanding how the typography was going to be laid out in an enticing way on the cover page figuring out how the table of content should be displayed, what was the concept and theme for the magazine, and then making sure that we got all the articles and everybody returned their corrections on time. <laughs> and uh, and then making sure that we had the correct paper in stock and making sure that the printer didn't jam. And, and then mm-hmm. after all of that, 
running it through the cycle of getting it mailed out to the individual households that were part of the membership was a lot. That I mean, that alone is a job. I mean, the fact that you were doing that on top of web stuff, on top of graphic Mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, my hat goes off to you because I've had those positions before where you're doing all the things because you're the only person that can do all the things. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It makes you indispensable to a point, but you get serious burnout after a while because it was like one thing after another. And I think a few minutes later, the or a few uh, months after the choir director left, and the choir director was responsible for printing the Sunday brochures. Mm-hmm. So after he left, guess who was responsible for printing the Sunday brochures? That was you. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so it was like I was at that job all the time, actually slept there. And one would not think that of like, oh, you're just a graphic designer at a church. No, no, friend. <laughs> no. I've done no, no, church friend. work before because sometimes what will happen, and I don't know if this happened maybe in your case, but sometimes what will happen is that your obligation to your job ends up getting wrapped up in some level of religiosity where like, mm. it's not just the work that you're doing for the church, but you're doing the work for God. Mm. Mm. No, no, that, <laughs> unfortunately that was not. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. They were very nice. I want to say the church was Episcopalian and I just was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh-huh. This, is, this is great. This is, I'm very happy for everyone involved. Yes, right. exactly that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like maybe if it had been, for lack of a better word, a black church, that might have changed because I feel like there's a level of guilt, guilt I find yeah, that black I churches say, are able to. And I'm like, I'm guilt. trying, how do I say this nicely? Um, <laughs> there's a level of guilt that only black churches. Because they're like, you. oh, well, you know, I, I, your grandmama Merlene. And I'm like, oh, no. So now I have to do this flyer. <laughs> <laughs> I empathize with that a hundred percent. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Especially if, like, your parents or family members are members of the church, too. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, yep. yeah, no, I'm I'm absolutely going to just have to to make this flyer and yeah. make Miss Miss Martha look good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So after your work at the church is when you sort of got more into, I would say, like digital design. You worked as a product designer and then a UX designer, which is, you know, what you're doing now. Was it a big Mm -hmm. shift to go from doing all the things at the church to now just focusing on, say, product or, or focusing on UX? Honestly, no. And I think that's because the church in its way of making me do everything prepared me for the slightly, and I do mean slightly, slightly less work of being a product or UX designer, because I'm only focused on one thing at that point. I'm not focused on doing everything. So it was kind of a breath of fresh air because I was like, oh, okay, I can just focus on the digital. I don't have to worry about the magazine and whatever and whatever, whatever. I can just do the digital. And then it also helped that I worked for a luxury travel agency. So I was just staring at beautiful pictures of hotels. Mm hmm all day long and being like, I will go there someday. Absolutely. But yeah, no, it wasn't too bad at all. I think a lot of my experience with my work in print actually helped with my work at digital because they actually also did print magazines, but I was responsible for the digital version of it. So since I already knew how to do all of that work from the church, it was like, oh, no, no, this is good. This is great. I can do this. And I think the engineering team had already set up a pretty decent templating system. So at that point, it was basically just like making sure that all of the digital stuff was set up in a way that I could just very quickly upload it to the web when I needed it to, whenever they needed to release a digital article. Because it wasn't like, and on my side, it wasn't like a set thing. So we only had, we only released like maybe one article, one or two articles a week. And so it was just basically sourcing photos and making sure that all of the digital stuff was set up on there. It wasn't until they decided to get to sort of end the print half or move the print half and mainly focus on digital in terms of like booking flights and booking hotels. Then that's when it was like, okay, so now we've shifted to the user experience side of things. Because before it was a lot of really just allowing consumers to just read articles, 
based on our recommendations for things. Mm -hmm. And so it was very narrow in that sense. And then when it came time to like book things, then it became, okay, so how does our booking thing work? How does search work? What is the experience if someone were to try to book a flight? Is it that they go to the travel agent or can they book directly? And what did the steps look like for that? So that's kind of where it shifted is that like that last piece of the UX of completing a full entire process to like get that sort of booked result versus I'm just serving you up an article on the best restaurant in LA Mm. type of thing. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. And I think for people Mm. that are listening, you know, I feel like at least nowadays UX and product tend to get conflated in a way like they may be subbed Mm -hmm. out one thing for another so i'm glad that you were kind of like pointing out what the differences are between those Mm -hmm. two they do both carry an aspect of user experience in the very basic sense of like how is a user meant to experience reading an article on restaurants versus how is a user meant to experience a checkout flow for booking a flight so they do share that in that regard you could sort of use them interchangeably. I don't think anybody would be mad. However, I do have friends who are product designers and I think they call them industrial designers now. I remember they'd be like, oh, I'm applying for a position for a product designer. And I'm like, mm, that's not what you think it is, friend. <laughs> <laughs> so it also depends on like what the company defines a product designer or a UX designer as, as well in the job description. Right. And so a lot of my industrial designer friends were like, this is lame. We're the product designers, not you guys. Yeah. So, yeah. What gives you purpose to like keep doing the work that you do? So I follow several people on Twitter who are in the disability activism space. And while I don't comment per se, them sharing their experiences fuels me to make the web better. The internet is not going anywhere, as far as I know. I would love it if they made it a utility, but I digress. And so I want everyone to have an equitable experience on the web. I want for, or I would like to be able to help that further along, whether it's being passionate about making sure that, you know, there's a contrast and the code is right and whatever. But I want, the web to be as equitable as possible because a lot of times when folks don't have access to these things, people's lives are in danger. No one talks about that side of it. But, you know, if you, if all of a sudden you're saying access to government grants and access to COVID vaccinations can only be achieved by going to a website, how many people are you cutting out with that one decision alone, especially if the web is not accessible enough to accommodate everybody. And so following these women and their work in that space really sort of fuels me to make sure that I champion it on my end as best as I can. How do you work to stay your like authentic self throughout your career? I mean, certainly I think when people hear this interview, they get that you've got like a bubbly personality and working in tech and then working in design and, you know, working in tech and news, I would imagine you encounter a lot of, you know, different types of folks. We'll just put it that way. But how have you, how have you kind of worked to stay your authentic self? Antoinette told me to, uh, I think, I think you've interviewed Antoinette Carroll. Oh yeah. I've had her on the show. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So she used to come hang out at the house whenever she would come in for South by Southwest. And we would have these long conversations about the work that she was doing and design equity. And she's amazing. And she's also another inspiration. But Antoinette was like, listen, you have to be authentic in your work all the time. You you just have to be. And I said, okay, yes, (laughs) (laughs) ma'am. I I just just do what she said. I trust her. And she's an amazing human. So, and I do find that it is helpful because people then know what they're getting from you. Mm -hmm. And I do tell people up front, I'm like this. I remember teasing my poor boss. I was like, are you sure you want to hire me? Because you were getting this mouth along with the (laughs) hire. So I need you to be okay with that. And he was like, no, no, it's fine. 
please, by all means, <laughs> bring your authentic self to work. And so I, and I appreciate that about my bosses at my company. They're very much supportive of that. And I have not run into a situation because, you know, sometimes they'll say that and they don't mean that. But I have not run into that thus far here. That's I'm, very, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Very grateful for that. Hashtag Antoinette taught me. <laughs> Listen, that could be a series in and of itself. My goodness. I miss her so much. Ah. Mm-hmm. What is the, the best piece of advice that you would give to somebody that kind of wants to follow in your footsteps? Like they've, they've heard your story. They want to be like mm-hmm. you. They want to be where you're at, at that level. Like, what would you tell them? Stay curious. Be curious about everything, how everything works, how people feel about things. Be observant. Watch people. Watch how things function. You'd be surprised what you can learn just by looking at a thing and being like, so what was that meant for? Um, we always used to joke that there's these products out there that the designers built them for one way, and then the users use them in a completely different way. And you're just like, mm-hmm. that's not what that was meant for. <laughs> but even that is some semblance of feedback. So, you know, just observing and being curious and watching and learning. Stay, stay learning. Be, stay curious and stay learning. Never stop learning. To that end, like, where do you see yourself in the next five years? What kind of work do you want to be doing? I feel like at the moment, my big thing is I'm planning on having my mom come live with me. So learning more about accessibility in terms of interior design and home design Mm -hmm. and making sure that everything is set up for her to live comfortably if she chooses to come live with me. So just sort of furthering my experience in accessibility, but just applying it to different things and seeing what that looks like. And then whatever I learned, share it with everybody who asked or didn't ask. <laughs> Y'all will get this accessibility on today, <laughs> as I say often. Just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience mm-hmm. find out more information about you, about your work? Where can they find that online? I tend to keep a low profile, but I am on LinkedIn. You can find me there. I am on Instagram, but I don't post often. I am a lurker, as it were. I think it's one of those things. Yeah, those are my two spots. What's the Instagram name? Ella Mango Design. It's from an old graphic design project that I did for my senior my senior year at university. But yeah, right. Ella Mango Design. Elephants and Mangoes. I thought my that what it might things. be. I, it sounded like mm-hmm. that what it might be. Elephants and Mangoes. Mm-hmm. Ella Elephants Mango and design. Mangoes, my two favorite <laughs> things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. Well, Tiffany Stewart, I want to thank you so much for coming on the thank show. You. Thank you for, I mean, sharing your story about just like, it sounds like you're someone that is just passionately curious about a lot of things. And you've yes. had the, the opportunity to be able to really kind of go into a lot of places with your career. I mean, an engineering degree, then doing design and then doing all these other things. Like it sounds like you're someone that is always trying to keep on the pulse of what's next. And I think, you know, of course, with accessibility being such an important topic to our world right now, I feel like we'll be hearing and seeing a lot more from you in the future. So thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. So lovely to do this. This is a lot of fun. (laughs) So yeah, no. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Big, big thanks to Tiffany Stewart. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Tiffany and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by R.J. Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Transcripts are provided by Brevity and Wit. This episode of Revision Path is also brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important, and that begins with your domain name. Show the online community who you are and what you're passionate about with Hover. With over 400 plus domain extensions to choose from, including all the classics and fun niche extensions, Hover is the only domain provider I use and trust. 
Go to Hover.com forward slash Revision Path and get 10% off your first purchase. So what did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? Don't be a stranger. We'd love to hear from you on social media. So please hit us up. We're on Twitter and we're on Instagram. Just search for Revision Path, like all one word. Or you can leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on Spotify. And I'll even read that review right here on the show. If it's a good review, if it's a five-star review, of course, I'll read it on the show. But you should be leaving five-star reviews anyway for your favorite design podcast, right? (laughs) The more people you tell about the show, the bigger we become. And the further we can extend our reach to talk to Black designers, developers, artists, and other digital creatives from all over the world. As always, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.